So we've heard a lot about statistics, but not so much about stories, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about the media. So I just want to start by asking, what is a story? Um, and it might seem obvious, but I think it's an important first question to start with. And of course, a story can be many things. It can be something that can grip you, make you laugh and cry, or rise up in righteous indignation, demanding social change. A good story can capture the public mood and, and galvanise change and make a real difference to society. And that's a big part of why we do the job. You know, but on a day-to-day -day level, you know, 300 words on page 17 probably isn't going to do that. Um, so how do we decide what is a story? Uh, the, the simple test that I uh, like to use is... I imagine a commuter um, jammed up into someone's armpit because there are no seats on the 753 again. And I imagine that person seeing what I've written and thinking, are they going to flick over to the picture of Kate Middleton on the next page? Or are they going to stop and go, hmm? Uh, and if they stop, it's a story. Uh, and it, if they, uh, then that's, it's not a scientific test, obviously. Uh, people have tried to do this scientifically using surveys, reader panels, dwell time uh, online, and they tend actually to come up with quite similar answers, actually. Um, so this does present a problem for those who are writing about science particularly. Because um, that hmm sound, which I like to think of as a sign of a story, you know, that, that tends to come when something is shocking or surprising or new or unexpected or, or jaw-dropping. And all of those things are probably great big red flags in most types of scientific research. Um, so to some degree, there is an inescapable conflict here in the sense that science does move in incremental advances where some studies are replicated and then others are, are knocked down and then freak results are thrown up and then they're not replicated and, and gradually a consensus uh, emerges. But in the newsroom, it, it, it just doesn't work like that. People say, well, didn't we hear that last week? Bored of it, don't care, it's old. Well, oh, here's a study that says drinking is good for you. Let's, let's do that, people like that. Now, that, that is difficult. And you could look at that and take the view, well, journalism just needs to grow up and, and, and get with uh, what scientists are telling it. Well, fine. But it works like that, basically, because people think like that. Um, you know, another study saying that smoking causes a slightly different cancer. Turn the page, ooh, look at Kate. But one saying peanuts will like, save your life. Ooh, hmm. I'll stop and read that. Um, so let's go back to some of the examples that, that David took, that chocolate um, makes you lose weight story, um, which is interesting, I think, partly for, uh, as he pointed out. Now, you would hope a good journalist would have a look at that and spot a paper that didn't specify its endpoints, never mind one that didn't include any numbers at all. Um, and indeed, only the Express and the Star, uh, amongst British newspapers, I looked it up on the database, actually cover that. And these are, even by tabloid standards, ones that have more or less given up on any pretense of really doing journalism. Um, it's a business strategy, and su uh, surprisingly, it seems to be working quite well. They're, they're not losing readers faster than anyone else. And so it's one of the most depressing facts there is in journalism. Anyway, it also highlights the, the other point that David was making, which is, yes, journalists do do a lot wrong, partly because sometimes we think, oh, that's too good a story to check. Some people, you know, that, you know there is a, such a thing as one question too many. Uh, and that is, there is a pressure to do that. Now, you hope responsible journalists don't do that. Um, and I like to think, as a, a specialist health reporter, I like to think my main role, really, is keeping the crap out of the paper. I mean, I am bombarded every day with wire stories, press releases, calls from, you know, from universities, from charities, from companies trying to flog stuff, all kinds of things. The vast majority of it, crap. Uh, and so my, my first task is to s stop that getting through me or sneaking around through a news editor who's not paying attention to try and stop that getting in the paper. Sometimes it works uh, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, and statisticians have an important role in helping us do that. The more of you point out that you know, these things don't work, the more we can go to a news editor and say, look, this really is nonsense. Please don't, don't put it in. It doesn't mean what you think it means. And that is an important role. Um, but sometimes it's not so clear cut. Um, and I think these days, the main reason why questionable, I'm not going to say junk, I think questionable studies do get so much prominence is because of the way they're presented. Now, David put the brain on press releases, and I think it's probably more the academics, actually, if blame is the right word, and I'm going to come to that, because sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't. Now, it is not wrong to say uh, a, a study has claimed that, that living near a busy road might make you fat, as that, as that example, because that is what the study was claiming. Uh, oh, it's not wrong to say that researchers have claimed that eating peanuts might extend your life. You know, people are making these claims, uh, you know, reputable people, based on the studies they have done. So if a story like that appears in another newspaper uh, or on the BBC website or all the other places that people look, and we reporters are asked, well, why didn't you do that? We've missed that. No, we can't say it's not true. 
the reporters did say that. That is a paper, it is published. Now, we could say, well, I judge that their claims would probably not, if repeated in randomised trials, stand up in the long term. <laughs> that answer would not go down very well in a newsroom. They will say, uh, the news editor will say, understandably, it is not your job to show off about your superior understanding of statistics. <laughs> it is your job to check whether stories are plausible, you know, done in an acceptable way by reputable people and, and peer-reviewed journalists. Uh, and, and if they are, just write the bloody thing. Um, so here's, here's a good time to explain perhaps how a newsroom works and, and how these conversations are sometimes had. Um, you know, people focus on reporters because that's the people's names who are on the story. Um, but I think these days probably most specialist reporters covering numbers are, you know, know what, the, what they should be looking out for. Um, but we report to, to the news desk, uh, news editors. Now these are the people that collate everything from the labour leadership to the badger cull to epigenetics to Islamic State. And they decide what goes on the front page and what's in the, on page 37. So their job is to select things to make sure everything that we write is as sharp as it can be, that we've made the important points clear, we haven't missed anything out, that people coming to it fresh on that commuter train can understand it, that we haven't slipped into, you know, haven't gone native and started using jargon um, that statisticians and scientists might use. And if they have, they rewrite it, especially if that's going to be given a prominent slot. Now, about this time of day, which I've sort of slipped out uh, when I really shouldn't have done, the newspaper office is a pretty noisy and stressful place with people shouting and saying, where the hell is the story? Uh, I need it now. Stop mucking about. Why are you giving a talk to statisticians when you should be writing a story about GPs? All that kind of thing. Uh, and so this is the time when stories are sort of rewritten uh, and caveats can be lost unless a report, you know, reporter says this is a very important thing and you, know, you can have stand-up rows with saying you have, to, you have to do this, you can't rephrase it like that but you can only do that so often, otherwise they say you're just, you're just a troublemaker. Um, and sometimes there's no opportunity to do that because it's five minutes to ten uh, and sorry, the page has got to go, we're just going to press send. Um, and that's how newspaper works and, and it's probably similar in, in TV and other things because you know, we are writing 80,000 words a day on every topic in the entire world and getting it done by 10 p.m. You know, sometimes mistakes are going to be made. We try our best to produce them, but that's the environment in which we're working. So the people we have to convince as reporters, are, um, they're not specialists. In fact, they're not, they don't even take an interest in any of these things. And I mean, it's sort of their point is they're not really particularly interested in any particular area. They are, and they're you know, designed to be, representative of the readers that, that the paper or what news organisation is serving. Um, so you can say to them, in the study we did about peanuts this morning, which, which we did, we had a discussion yesterday, you could say to them that you know, residual confounders are probably the most likely explanation. Uh, uh, and the, well, first they'll say, if you ever say residual confounders to me again, you're fired. Um, <laughs> And you can explain to them that, you know, actually, you know, people think, well, it's probably not the peanuts. It is more likely, uh, you know, people are saying this could be that, but it could be the fact that, you know, this is just a signifier of a healthy life and all that kind of thing. And they'll say, you know, fine, okay, but researchers are saying this, aren't they? Well, yes, they are. It will be in the Telegraph, won't it? Well, yes, it will. <laughs> well, so put the caveats in, put all the quotes representing other point of view, but you're going to put it in because people would read it, and, and they do, and they, because people, you know, they're just interested in stuff. Now, this comes to the next bit about blame. Is it wrong for people to be interested in this stuff? I mean, the assumption generally is, yes, it is. And Dave said, I don't want to read. You know, if, if the answer, if the study had reported another finding, I don't want to read it. Now, that's, that's probably quite a good test, actually. But it doesn't mean that it's wrong to have those stories, I think. You could say, well, if people are reading them, it's a reflection of the general level of scientific education. Well, you know, perhaps it is. But uh, I think a newspaper has to reflect what its readers want and not preach them, as long as it's honest to them, it can't be trying constantly to talk down to them, uh, otherwise no one reads it. Just look at the independent. Now, <laughs> now, now, now personally, I'm not very interested in, in diet stories either, even though I write quite a lot of them. But it's slightly condescending, I think, to say, well, just because we're not interested, no one else should be either. Um, now, we do sometimes write stories about, uh, well, me and my science editor, uh, the colleague uh, who covers that, does write stories sometimes about how many flimsy papers there are in reputable scientific journals, how many of them don't get replicated, and you know the fact that you can pay to get published, all that kind of thing. Um, often we publish these when those studies are published in um, reputable peer-reviewed journals, but you know that never gets as much coverage as a story about chocolate. It's just it's just not going to. So I think as long as we're honest with readers about what the research actually shows and what it doesn't, we have to let them decide what they're going to be interested in. Uh, and I think. There is a, a broader issue here as well about what is the role of you know, statistics or science and 
wider public debate. I mean, take screening, uh, since you write about it a lot. Uh, you know, explain to news editors why most people who test positive for cancer won't actually have it. It's, it's not easy. It's not intuitive. Um, yeah, but they're smart people. Well, most of them are, anyway. Um, you know, they, they do get it after, after a while and some diagrams. Um, but, but what they do with that is actually comes down to a matter of personal judgment in the end. I mean, I rem remember writing a story about finding prostate cancer screening. Say, so it would save lives, but for every life you save, you would treat, I think it was 27 men, unnecessarily. So they said, bad idea. But now our chief leader writer said, no, this is nonsense. I don't care. I still want that test. Now, who are we to say that's the wrong decision? And in a way, I think this is one of the roles of newspapers, is to take the point where a very specialist subject like statistics you know, becomes a matter of public debate and say where it stops being a technical subject with a right answer and starts becoming a matter of, of democratic uh, judgment. And then it also David said that you know, epidemiologists should stop giving public health advice. Well, I don't think they should. I think anyone should be allowed to give public health advice as long as we can challenge them and say, what is this, what is this based on? Uh, I don't think we should you know, lock people up in particular boxes. We have to let people have this public debate and our orders to challenge them. Yeah, but what is the evidence on which you're, on which you're saying this? Uh, so I've been a bit defensive uh, f so far. So I think I want to talk a little bit now about what reporters actually want from numbers. I mean, the main thing is uh, we want a trend. Is something going up or is something going down? It's pretty simple stuff because that's what produces the compelling narrative. Um, and someone, because someone was always going to have an explanation for what, what it is, why something is going up, why something is going down. Uh, now that explanation may well be wrong. Uh, and if it is great, because then someone else will have a different view, and then you have a row, uh, and everyone loves a row. <laughs> so, I mean, here I think the job is of statistics is to establish some basic facts and say what you can say and what you can't say. And then, you know, if it can't go any further than that, except other people are going to take over. Um, now, now we have a data team at, at the Times with our own pet statistician, uh, who we occasionally get to look through uh, official data and manipulate it. And, you know, he could come up with stuff. And it's actually been quite an interesting sort of cultural clash trying to integrate that into the newsroom. Because without the context, a lot of these numbers are just meaningless. You have to ask the question that is going to get you the answer that is interesting to your readers in the first place. You know, I did take an example. I did an analysis of hospital admissions data early this year. And we helped. And Stefano, our statistician, made sure we analyzed the data properly, we used it in the right way. But you know, what do you do with that when you find it? Now, we found a lot of things with no obvious pattern, the people leaving uh, A&E units without treatment, or the numbers, and all that kind of things. So we found, one thing we found, like, oh, the, the rate at which people have to re-attend A&E units, so come back for more treatment within a week, that seems consistently 10% higher over the last year than the previous year. Now, what do you do with that? And I think, well, there could be chance. There could be lots of other explanations for it. But you know, you, I speak to doctors and, and, and managers and other people think, well, this tallies with their experience of People not getting GP appointments, cares are getting a bit more rushed uh, as people can't get seen, and so things are not going right the first time, so they have to come back. So that might be wrong, but I think it's a compelling story, which I think is plausible, so that's the story we went with, and I think that's the sort of thing we should be doing. Uh, now, another thing that we want from, from numbers, really, I want to just say forty numbers, and this is more sensitive among you might want to look away here, it's basically just as a prop, um, you know, a crutch. Uh, you know, numbers are not to, to really prove or discover something, but to lend weight to what we thought or suspected through, through other methods. And you know, this can be bad through some of the, the sort of dodgy surveys that we've, we've seen this afternoon, which sort of are really just an excuse for people to write about you know, mobile phones, are oh, kissing in bed, aren't children lazy these days, all that kind of thing. But you know, done right, I think this is actually can be a useful method, so I'm going to defend it. I mean, I'd give you an example when I've done it myself. Um, so I heard a, a couple of stories about people who said they'd been discharged from hospital late at night because suddenly they needed the beds and it was a bit of a panic and it's interesting. So I spoke to some managers and they said, well, what they reckon, it might be a bit of a, a sneaky way of relieving pressure on, on hospitals because it's one of the few things in the NHS isn't measured if you just wake someone up at 3 a.m. and sort of bung them out into the street. So oh, that's interesting. So I did an FOI to all the hospitals in England saying, how often do you discharge people between, uh, I think it's 11 p.m. and 6 a.m.? So I did that and all came back. And the data was a total mess. It was a total mess. Um, people were counting things in different ways. They were including different units. They were using slightly different definitions of admission. Uh, they, some of them had systems that defaulted for midnight when no one put in a, a number. Some people would say, yes, we've got that, but we've automatically excluded everyone at midnight to zero. So I mean, it was totally not, you couldn't compare it at all. Uh, it, was a, it was a bit of a dog's dinner in a way. So I thought, well, what, what do I do here? I could have just abandoned it. I, I don't have the uh, 
capacity to spend a year trying to persuade them to do this in a comparable way, and I don't have the power to force them to do it. But So what I did was I just used the data as a prop, essentially. Uh, I wrote a big front-page story, basically, making the essential point. This sort of thing is happening a lot. The actual number wasn't really that important. I said hundreds of thousands of times, because that was the rough, the, rough, the rough order of magnitude that the data was giving me. He didn't want to commit to too, too much. All I wanted was a big number and doctors telling me what, what this was going on. And then after that, the floodgates opened. You know, dozens of people called in to say what happened to them. You know, Radio 5 Live devoted an entire morning of their phone in to people saying, oh, yes, this happened to my mum, all that kind of thing. One bloke called up to said he was woken up at 4 o'clock and told to hitchhike home, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it was a real issue. And the health secretary, you know, and the medical director of the NHS said, you know, Roach Hospital said, you can't be doing this and you need to measure it properly. Uh, so it was a powerful story that changed practice, but one that, that used, used numbers but were not the central point, essentially. Um, I want to ground scale my colleague, Andrew Norfolk. Um, uh, he is the, the man who sort of single-handedly exposed the widespread abuse of vulnerable children and the way social services essentially ignored that abuse for years uh, because they didn't want to be accused of, of racism. Uh, and it was a really powerful and strong story. But the way that started was, again, him just having a feeling from cases to cover people who talked to that something was going wrong. So to sort of kick it off, he, what he did was he trawled the, the court records to find uh, of people who'd been convicted of this particular crime to find out, I think it was, that, that 53 out of uh, 56 of them were from the same British-Pakistani background. And he said, well, something's going on here. Now, we, we did a big story on this, and the first reaction was to say, this is outrageous, this is wrong. He was accused of racism, uh, and more probably more importantly for this audience, he was hauled over the coals, or more or less, for, for non-scientific use of numbers, and his sampling method wasn't very good. But the point is that that story broke the logjam, because it was expressing something was true, other victims came forward, whistleblowers, uh, and he persisted, and you know, it culminated in a big report saying that the, at least 1,400 people in Rochdale alone had been uh, abused, uh, resignation of the entire council, and, and a complete overhaul of the, the national attitude, I think, towards child protection. So it's the story that used statistics, but was not actually about them. So I suppose what I'm, to sum up what I'm saying here is that with statistical journalism, in some ways we're doing the same thing in that we're both trying to find out what's really going on uh, and to inform people. But we are doing it in different ways that, that should be held, I think, to different standards. Now, it would be ridiculous to criticise statistical work for taking you know, several days to achieve something and being a bit cautious about what it was you'd actually find. You know, that's an essential part of the way you work. Uh, but it wouldn't work in journalism. Uh, and news is meant to be quick and it's meant to be arresting. And so to criticise journalism for being that, I don't think make any sense either. Now, I think that gives us space to work together, both for st statisticians to say where we're getting it wrong and where we shouldn't look and where we're going down a blind alley, and also to help us you know, use the power of numbers to find out about something that people will want to, to know about, uh, and illuminating interesting issues that, that can't really be substantiated in, in any other ways. But it is important to remember that we do have different roles, and that is why I think so many of these miscommunications happen. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. I have a, I'm Omar Jamshed. I'm the press officer for Society for Endocrinology. Um, actually, I find that the, the biggest problems I have with um, just the whole uh, the nature of my work is actually with scientists wanting to promote themselves more than anything. I, I have to say it's anecdotal, so I don't know if all press officers are the same, but journalists have been very good. I'm curious about um, what you have to say about your trust, your trust in scientists. Has that changed recently? And that's in response to Kevin's slides earlier. I'm uh, just curious to hear your thoughts. Well, I mean, I, I think that, that, I mean, Kevin was right to say that a lot of re reason why people like numbers is there is a sort of spurious air of authority around numbers and, and someone who's a scientist and saying something that it, that it must be true. I mean, I think that has generally started to be a bit more eroded. And as journalists, we are slightly aware of that aura and to some extent use it for our own purposes if we want to sort of bolster something. It's help, more helpful to have a scientist saying it than it is you know, to have a, a minister or something like that. Um, but no, I don't think that's necessarily changed the way I think about it. We know scientists are human beings. Some of them are very you know, ambitious and want to get their name out there. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we like it if they're keen, keen to speak to us and we will form our own judgments about whether they are, uh, you know, what, whether what they're saying is interesting or not. Now, they will, uh, 
the advantage of discussing whether it's plausible and rigorous, but of course we will hopefully run that by other people who will sometimes take very different views uh, on that. So some of these stories that get criticised, I don't think they're are rightly so, but some of them are like, well, I don't think there is a right answer to that, so it's a disputed thing, that's, that's part of the fun. My question's about FOI, I thought it probably would come up at some point yeah. today. Um, so obviously a lot of journalists do use it, and I remember getting the uh, what time you discharge when I worked at a hospital, yeah. um, and I think we discharged most of ours at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, I know we didn't. But anyway, my question is really, um, for me as quite an open, hopefully, press person, kind of how can I convince people like you to not use the FOI Act and just actually pick up the phone and go, do you know what, I'm really interested in a story on this. How can I work with you to do it? Because some of the barriers I think we have as press people is there's a lot of nervousness in organisations around, oh God, you know, we don't want to put context around those. Mm. Whereas I think sometimes if we know you want to do a story on it, it's a lot easier as a press person to say, right, I actually just want to work with, say, Chris or who, mm. whoever and actually get them what they want. And I think a lot of, organ I'm not saying this about where I work now, but I've worked in a lot of organisations in the past who just see FOI and basically shit themselves and kind of don't want to give context. And actually, if it's just a kind of journalist to press relationship, sometimes it can be easier to get what the journalist wants back to the journalist. <coughs> am I making sense or am I talking yeah, to Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think that's right. And I think that's part of the value of specialist reporters who will cover the same area and, and will know, you know to call people, people like you. Um, and I, I never think it makes a lot of sense to try and shut journalists out, if, if only because it's much easier to think of something as a faceless, evil corporate entity if, if, they're not, if there's no one on the other end of the phone you know, trying to explain what they're, what they're doing. So it is, I think you do get more context. As long as you know, we get the, the journalists get the data that we're asking for, it is always more helpful to have that conversation and say what you think it means. We may disagree with you, but yes, I agree that's a useful conversation to have. Thank Chris again. Thank you.